next on Contemplate. This is the issue that we all have. It's, a, it's the status of human nature, right? We all want to live how we want to live. The problem is that what we want to do is often not what we ought to do. And because there is a God and there are objective moral values and duties, we have a problem. That was Pastor David Robinson from Axe Church in Vancouver, Washington. And this is another Contemplate episode. As Pastor David continues this Seeking Skeptics series, he's talking about the problem of good. Is there really such a thing as good and bad? And if so, what does that really mean? Let's find out. So the argument goes like this. This is the argument, okay? The problem of good. This is the moral argument for the existence of God. It says this. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists, okay? The first objection I want to deal with is this idea, why does God have to exist for objective moral values to exist? Why? Here's the deal. Objective moral values and duties have to be grounded somewhere. They have to be grounded somewhere. And the only logical place that any philosophers have found to ground such values is in a personal being who is outside, who's outside of the system, who has a nature that is good. So we're grounding those values in the nature of God. That's what we call this being, this personal being that's powerful outside of nature and totally good. Okay, if we do not ground objective moral values and duties in God, in a being that is himself objectively good, then we don't have objective moral values and duties. Even atheists agree with this, okay? I'm not, I'm not pulling one over on you. This is well known in the world of philosophy. So uh, Richard Dawkins says this, it's pretty hard to defend absolutist morals, that's to say objective morals, right? Morals that exist outside of ourselves. It's pretty hard to defend absolutist morals on grounds other than religious ones. It's pretty hard to do. Yeah, impossible. Impossible to do. Here's what Jean-Paul Sartre said, okay? This is a French existentialist philosopher. Not very fancy. French people are fancy in general. Um, this guy's particularly so. He says, towards 1880, when the French professors endeavored to formulate a secular morality, okay, to formulate a morality that did not require God, is what he's saying. They said, nothing will be changed if God does not exist. We shall rediscover the same norms of honesty, progress, and humanity, and we shall have disposed of God as an out-of-date hypothesis which will die away quietly of itself. The existentialist, on the contrary, finds it extremely embarrassing that God does not exist. For there disappears with him all possibility of finding values in an intelligible heaven. There can no longer be any good a priori, since there is no infinite and perfect consciousness to think it. It is nowhere written that the good exists, that one must be honest or one must not lie, since we are now upon the plane where there are only men. Dostoevsky once wrote, if God did not exist, everything would be permitted. And that, for existentialism, is the starting point. Everything is indeed permitted if God does not exist. And man is in consequence forlorn, for he cannot find anything to depend on, either within or outside himself. Here's the bottom line. Atheists, thinking atheists, people who think well, who have thought through their position fully, realize that without God... There can be no such thing as objective moral values or duties. Okay? This is just well known. That's why the argument says what it says. Because without God, there can be no objective moral values or duties. Here's the issue. Moral laws require a moral law giver. Moral laws require a moral law giver. Duh, right? They have to come from somewhere. That moral lawgiver must be a mind higher than the mind of humans or back to subjective morality. Okay, by definition. If it's just one of us who's coming up with this, why should I go with yours rather than mine? 
I like my ideas better than your ideas. The only way that it binds, that it gives us a standard, that it controls, that it can actually say you ought or you ought not, is if it's grounded in God, in the personal God outside the system. All right. I want to read a few quotes from people who also provided objections uh, when I asked for those objections before we began this skeptics uh, series here. Okay? One, of the, one of the people said this, I don't want to live my life based on a book. It's my life, and I'm trying to be happy with it by living the way I want to. Okay, this is not an objection based in philosophy or reason, but in personal desire. I actually like this objection for its honesty. It's a very honest objection. The person's saying, I object because I want to live by subjective moral values. I'm trying to be happy by living the way I want to, the person says, right? Um, I want to live by my rules. Uh, It's not saying that the Bible is not true. It's not saying that moral laws that we find in the Bible aren't true. But it's rather saying, "I I want to live by my own rules. This person's honest enough to highlight the true issue we all have. This is the issue that we all have. It's it's the status of human nature, right? We all want to live how we want to live. The problem is that what we want to do is often not what we ought to do. And because there is a God and there are objective moral values and duties, we have a problem. We have a problem. This is the place where the Christ follower can give an answer that is historically valid, okay, logical, and consistent with our experience. Another person wrote this before I get there. I believe in God, but don't believe he punishes people for their sins, which is to say, I believe in God. I believe in sins, clearly. That's, those are implied by the statement. But I don't believe that God punishes people for their sins. So there's an objective moral, there are objective moral values and duties. Clearly, people violate them, and yet I don't believe that God punishes people for that. Here's the deal. And this might be tough for some of us. This can't be true. This can't be true. If God is, in fact, good, which he must be, in order to provide a standard for objective moral values and duties, God must be good, then he must punish people for breaking his laws. He must. Why? Because justice is among the moral values and duties, right? It's one of those moral values for those who violate moral duties. Justice must be done. People become very upset, okay? Very angry, and rightly so, when someone who commits some heinous crime gets off on a technicality, right? When somebody does, it's one of the reasons people don't like lawyers, Right, among many, okay? But that's one of them. Is when some lawyer comes in and gets some person upon whom justice ought to be done, and they get them off and they don't face the punishment for the crime that they've committed, we something inside us goes, uh uh-uh, uh, unfair, unjust. What is that thing? Subjective moral values and duties. Now, if God didn't follow those moral values and duties that even we can see are correct, he wouldn't be good. He wouldn't be good. So God must, must enforce the consequences for violations of moral values and duties, or else God is not good, okay? We know that society enforces the law, and we demand it, because it's good that they should do so, assuming that the law is good, okay? Not always true. But a good God must do the same, or we would no longer believe God was good. And there'd no longer be a basis for objective moral values and duties because the person in whom those objective moral values and duties existed wasn't himself objectively good. So we'd have all kinds of problems. So another person wrote this. They said, I do take issue with people who think that their beliefs give them free passes when it comes to being decent moral human beings. If one's actions and thoughts are ugly, merely being a God-fearing Christian doesn't erase that and make one immune to the consequences of being thoughtless, unkind, greedy, judgmental. I agree. I agree. There is no escape from the need for consequences for evil thoughts and actions. Whether someone claims to be a God-fearing Christian or a God-denying atheist or it doesn't matter who you are. There must be consequence for your action. Whether this person believes in God, they're saying, you know, whatever. But, I, but here's what I don't like. I don't like it when people think that they can escape the consequences for their actions. 
This is so ingrained. We understand this. Consequences must come if there are objective moral values and duties. Now, here's the thing. You're you're with the church today, so you're going to hear this. This is why Christians are so big on the cross of Jesus Christ. We believe that God became a man in order to take on the consequences for our violation of God's objective moral values and duties. That's the basis of Christian belief. That's the basis of this faith. Okay? We believe that Jesus Christ bodily rose from the dead okay, after paying that price for us. And we believe that it is a historical fact with, as the book of Acts says, many infallible proofs. And that's Acts 1.3. Once we believe there are objective moral values and duties, which we all do, you know that you do, you confirm that you do every time you say that's not fair, that's not right, I'm going to advocate for whatever it is, whatever political position you take, you hold that with the fervor that it's objectively right, that other people ought to believe the same thing that you do. You don't just hold it with a fervor that it's your own personal opinion or belief, and it could be one way or it could be the other, depending on your mood or what you had for breakfast. You think it's objectively right. And so since you believe that objective moral values and duties exist, okay, since you believe that, and we know this, that we have all violated these objective moral values and duties. Once we know that, we've got a problem, right? We have this good God, have to. Couldn't have the objective moral values and duties if we didn't. So we believe in those. We must believe in him. We also know that we haven't followed them, that we've broken them, that we've violated them. We also know that if he's good, there must be consequences for that. And so we've got to find a way to reconcile. This is why people talk about things like, well, I've done more good than bad. I got more of my good pile than my bad pile. Sometimes people say that. I'm like, "Mm, I've known you for a long time. I'm not sure that's true right? Um, But either way, the question is, does that matter? Does that matter? We know that we violated these objective moral values and duties, and once we know that, we need to know how to get right with the objective moral lawgiver, God. So for us, our belief system provides a reasonable, coherent answer, comprehensive and coherent answer. We believe that Jesus Christ provides that answer in the way that makes the most sense logically. And we believe he proved his claim to the truth about these matters when God raised him from the dead. But that was the proof point. That historical fact, you can go back and look at, on our Seeking Skeptics page, you can go back and look at the last Skeptics Forum. We have all those messages up. And the last one on there, number seven, is about the resurrection and the proof for that. So if you're wondering about the proof for that in the Christian faith, go and look there. Okay, But here's what Romans 6.23 says. This is out of the ISV. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in union with the Messiah, Jesus, our Lord. Listen. God must enforce the consequences of our lawbreaking. He must. The wages of our sin, the consequences of our lawbreaking, is death, separation from God cannot be, if he's good, which he has to be, we already said that, to provide these moral values and and duties, he's got to be good, perfectly good, then he can't be in community, in connection with anything that's not, or all of a sudden that taints him and he's no longer good, okay? So we have a problem, but God, as this verse says, also himself provided our way out of death by paying the price for our sins, and giving eternal life to all those who believe in him and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what we believe, okay? It's one of the reasons we believe it is based on this argument. This argument for the problem of good. A problem for the atheist that there is such a thing as good. Okay? Here's another quote from uh, one of the people. They said this, To believe or not to believe, that is a loaded question. One true message is very clear. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is the easiest, most powerful message, and anyone can live by it. Whether this person believes in God or not, they're saying, that's that's a loaded question. 
But I definitely believe in this, they say. I definitely believe objective moral values and duties exist, and here's one of them. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I agree. This person is absolutely right. That is an objective moral value. It's an objective moral duty. Okay? I disagree that anyone can live by it. I would offer that no one except Jesus Christ has ever been able to live by it. That's the problem. That's where this argument for the existence of God, this piece of cumulative evidence that we're now putting on the stack in favor of God's existence, that's where this piece meets the message of Christianity. Because you have to have some answer for what you're going to do and how you're going to answer that objective moral lawgiver. You've got to have an answer for him. If objective moral values and duties exist, then God exists. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Okay? Since, since most of us are going to agree with that second premise, that objective moral values and duties exist, and even atheists agree that the first premise is true, that if they exist, then God exists, and the conclusion is a logical certainty if the premises are true, then we have very good reasons to believe that God exists. This is not the belief of some anti-intellectual group of farmers. Okay? Nothing wrong with farmers. I just that was one of the people who said something about farmers in their thing, as if farmers don't know how to figure things out. Any of you are farmers, I think you're smart. I think we all are. Okay? But people, but people sort of try to, they're really, when they're talking about farmers, they're talking about Bronze Age farmers, right? They're saying this is, this is a fairy tale invented by farmers in rural areas in the, in the Middle East a long, long time ago, and people have continued to believe in it because it gives them hope or it gives them peace or it works for them. But it has no basis in reality. It's not philosophically relevant. Well, there it is. Boom. It is philosophically relevant. And some of the most intelligent people that have lived in the last 2,000 years have believed this with all their heart because they believe that the evidence was sufficient, that the evidence was sufficient to have good reason to believe that God exists. And not only that he exists, but that Jesus Christ is God, his son. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're good. Thank you that you died for us, Lord. You are the lawgiver. You are perfectly good, Lord, and we have violated your law in every which way, every way we could think of and some that we couldn't. And yet you've forgiven us in Jesus Christ, Lord, that you gave the law, that we broke it, but that you paid for it, Lord, is the most amazing fact that exists in this universe. It is the most incredible thing that has ever happened. It is the center of reality, Lord, in Jesus Christ. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you exist and that you give us good reasons to believe it, that we're not blindly following something, that we don't have to stumble around in the dark, but rather that you've given us much that we can find that shows us who you are and that, in fact, you've imprinted on our heart these understandings of you and your law so that we have to go, what is this thing in my heart? And we follow that path, and it leads to you, God. It leads to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you are, all that we are in you and through you. Thank you for your church. I pray for those who are struggling and suffering, health difficulties, financial difficulties, things that are going on in the family, things that are going on at work, Lord. I just pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit and comfort and give peace for those to get through the trials that they're going through, that you would end the trials and give good times of refreshing and peace. Lord, but until that time when you do so, Lord, give us strength and let us live in your strength. Lord, we lay ourselves down. We lay ourselves down to you. We submit ourselves to you because you are the only good king and you have shown us that you are good. And we understand it by the very nature of understanding there's such a thing as good that it must come from you. We love you, Lord. Help us to seek you and serve you and follow you with all of our heart. We confess you as Lord. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor David Robinson, and if you like what you've heard today, let me invite you to come hear Pastor David in person at Axe Church in Vancouver, Washington. 
You can find easy directions and all the info you need at axchurchnw.org or call 360-885-9000. Hope to meet you this Sunday. Now, having talked about the problem of good, in our next episode, Pastor David will teach us about the problem of bad. And I hope you'll join us here on Contemplate. Contemplate.